All right. <laughs> so, oh man, that thing's going to be there again. Oh well. Um, yeah, so this talk is a little general because, I mean, it's the first meeting. Not everybody is into everything. Um, so this is pretty much just about the scope of game design. I guess that's, that's what you would end up calling this. Um, but it's definitely titled something else. It's titled <laughs> The Language of Game, Stories in the Simulation Dream. I don't know. I thought Wind Waker was like, I don't know. That game gave me good vibes. When that game first came out, I was just kind of like, why did they sell shade everything? But now, it kind of fits. Eh, whatever. It fits. <laughs> it fits. It fits. It fits. It's wonderfully fits. It's comfortable. OK, I'm sorry, Dave. It fits <laughs> like a dream. Like everything I've ever wanted. So um, pretentious. OK, so <laughs> language of game. What? OK, yeah, so I'm being very like artful in the way that I word this. I don't think anyone would be able to really define it. It's super broad. But it's definitely something you can hear a game speaking to you when you're playing it. Uh, and it's, it's something you don't really need to know a language to understand, except, of course, if you don't read the language that the game is in, yeah, I guess you probably won't be able to understand it. <laughs> but aside from that, if there's, like Mario, if there's no real words in that that you need to know, it's something you can just kind of feel that's right. Um, so, oh yeah, it's really quiet. <laughs> Anybody hear that noise? Yeah. What was that noise? The coin. Right, the coin in Mario. But on its own, it's kind of like this little tinny da -da thing. Eh, it's all right. But in conjunction with this picture, it just kind of feels right. Um, and this is going to be a progression. Right now, this isn't quite what I want to talk about in this talk. But this is an example, and it's a pretty large part of the language of game. So I thought I'd at least cover it, which is I don't know, something about that really tinny coin noise and the way this ugly shape jumps out <laughs> of that block. It just feels right. And maybe maybe that's in part because it's so ingrained in pop, into pop culture and all of our memories. But I like to think it's something more than that. Um, so this is getting a little closer to what I want to talk about. And Earthbound, it's a great game. If you haven't played it, you should do it. It's wonderful. Um, it's great in like every way too. It's not too hard and the story is just like really fulfilling. I don't know. But the point is at the very beginning of this game you encounter this dude named Pokey who is a complete jerk. And you can tell he's a jerk because at the very beginning of the game um, you end up going outside to investigate some kind of happening with your dog. And your dog is nice and when you encounter evil birds or like dogs or just random rabid animals, your dog helps you kill them uh, and fight them off and defends you and stuff like that. And then later you go back home because you can't find anything. Then this jerk comes banging on your door and is like, no, you have to help me find my brother. Like, oh, he's lost, blah, 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 blah. And so you go out to fight with him and quickly realize that he's not going to help you fight. It doesn't say that, but while you're fighting, where you would expect your dog to be like, yeah, look, does 10 damage to this thing. It just says, like, Pokey, like, runs into a corner and cowers and cries. <laughs> and I thought that was excellent because it's, it's not something that they blatantly throw at you that they're just like, Pokey is a jerk. Remember this. <laughs> they let you feel this hatred toward him because you hate him. You feel this through the gameplay itself. And that's just, that's so perfect. That just feels right. Like, they get the game through to you by playing it. It's awesome, awesome. Uh, another smaller example is that whenever you encounter enemies with psychic abilities, you're just kind of like, whoa, what just happened here? And you can tell that that place that you're in is special just simply because of that. And they don't say, this place is special, or the enemies will now have psychic abilities, but it's just something that comes up and you're like, what? Like, they can do that? What's going on here? Um, even closer. And this didn't resonate with some people, but it really, really struck a chord with me, which is in The Walking Dead, if you haven't played it, um, it's basically a choose-your-own-adventure. It's like watching a show where you sometimes pick up like the mouse and like click something, basically. But it's really good. It's, it's hard to explain, but it's pretty excellent. And something that I thought was great about that game is that they made the characters feel so much more fleshed out and gave you a much more personal experience with the game by this one really simple line. 
So you have this girl, Clementine, following you around, and her parents are gone for some reason or another. Uh, it's a zombie apocalypse, go figure. And she has to learn all these life lessons from you instead of from her parents. And so whenever you make a decision that she's watching or that will impact like the way she thinks about the world, it says Clementine will remember that at the top of the screen. And I don't think I've felt more guilty in any <laughs> other game than when I did something like awful and then it's like Clementine will remember that. <laughs> and you're like, oh, I just ruined this little girl's life. It's. I thought that was excellent. And some people think it pulls you out of the game. But I think that creates a great emotional attachment to the character itself, but also to the way you play the game. And so what's the progression here? We're going from just kind of like, yeah, it feels right, to creating this attachment with the game, this personal experience that you're deriving out of it. And that's really why we play games. Like, what is a game about if it's not about getting the experience you want out of it? So the, the point is basically that it's not just you kind of experiencing something. It's that that experience becomes personal to you. So Thomas Grip, it's really cool. Amnesia Machine for Pigs comes out in seven hours now, probably. Uh, I just checked. <laughs> he helped design that game, was the main designer of that game. Uh, and I really like him, not just because he made those games, but because he has a lot to say about games, and it's usually something like really, really cool. Uh, I can't get into a lot of it, but really something that he talks about a lot is like, story isn't just the plot of the game. Like the plot of Amnesia, eh, sure. But it's the experience that you get out of the game. It's the story that you create within the game that you kind of feel. And I thought that's, yeah, that's like perfect. The story, is not just this plot that you're being forced down. It's what you take out of the game yourself. So character setting, anything you throw into the game, is just a tool for the player to take and get an experience out of. And that's awesome. So because it's interactive, because the player gets this experience out of the game, you can actually let them do a lot of the work for you. And that brings me to this word, apophenia. What does that mean? Well, it reminds me of this stupid meme where, or not just a meme, it's just a joke, where it says there are two kinds of people in this world. Those who can extrapolate from incomplete data. Can. No. <laughs> and, and the joke is that in order to understand the joke, you need to be able to extrapolate from incomplete data. Like, that's, that's the point. Um, and that's not quite true because Everybody can do that, and it's what makes games fun for a lot of people. Um, technically, the definition is like it's seeing random or it's seeing patterns in random or meaningless data. But I want to expand that a little bit. Okay, hopefully this is not. Oh yeah, so I changed the video, so it's no longer that weird song. It's a less weird song that has a worse example, but is less uh, weird. Weird. <laughs> weird is not the word. <laughs> okay. You can ignore this. It's the, it's the main thing that he says that's important. Obviously, this is the Bollywood thriller, but. <laughs> So why am I showing you this? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, we're done. We're done. <laughs> so those were popular when I was little. Um, and they're awful, but. <laughs> so I don't know. Can anybody guess why I showed you that? Trying to find meaning out of like the right, right. Speak that if, if you don't speak that language, it's it can be funny because you're like it really does sound like he's saying girly man, uh, just that entire song. And so that's the kind of apophenia that I'm getting at is seeing something that's meaningless and saying like oh and deriving this experience out of it. So Simlish, the language the Sims speak, was actually developed by linguists. If you didn't know this, so like that blathering gibberish that they say, like 
people actually design that language to sound like a language, which is kind of cool. Because have you ever seriously like been playing The Sims and thought, oh, I've heard them say this before? Anyone? Mm -hmm. yep. You have? Yep. Really? Yeah. Like you've heard like the, OK. Which Depends which like. Sims. They, <laughs> they tried to expand it a lot. But the point I'm trying to get out of this is like, if you're playing The Sims, it's a lot harder to hear the same thing multiple times because you don't understand it. Like, it's just kind of gibberish to you. Um, and they actually tried it out with English when they were designing the game. So Will Wright, that's, whose win was that? Professor Patrick's. <laughs> anyway, um, Will Wright, when designing The Sims, was like, you know what, like, let's try it with English. And they did, and The Sims just sounded like robots. You would hear the same thing over and over again and be like, oh, they're just doing this thing again. Whereas it's a lot harder to come across that while you're playing The Sims because you don't really understand what's going on. Or not. No, I didn't. Just clicked on the wrong thing. So how do we like create this? Obviously, they sort of like tried, but is it reproducible? So Tynan Sylvester, he worked on Bioshock Infinite. Um, he thinks you totally can, and he has this list of stuff that you can do to try to get people to fill out the blanks for you. So like make your job easier when you're designing the game, right? So if you borrow archetypes from real life and fiction, if you, I don't know, you have the same old hashed out princess dragon guy saving her story, you can actually just kind of barely hint at that, and then the player will be like, oh, like I understand all of this other stuff about their world just because they kind of hinted at this one little archetype. Um, if you allow the player to project themselves into the game, I like this one. Um, that's basically anything from creating your character to just naming stuff. In Earthbound, some of the most personal experiences for me was when I named like his dog or his favorite thing or his favorite food as like a dirty word, and then it just like <laughs> comes up randomly in the game, and you're just like, did they just say that? <laughs> it's pretty good. Um, and I don't know, that's what I took out of Earthbound. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I think that one's especially powerful, but you can also create in certain situations with human relevant values and the balance. What that basically means is you want to choose something that makes sense to people that they would actually care about. So this is a bad example, but if you had a game that was about a robot in a robot universe where they were taking away all the metal and they made the robot very sad, it's hard to get attached to that because you don't care. Like, you're not a robot, and you will not be sad if they take the metal away from you. Whereas if you're playing a game about someone who is about to be, like, left alone forever or is dying, you can actually kind of get something out of that and pull this emotional attachment. It's just basically a way to derive from this person's past experiences an emotional response by simply hinting at some kind of human relevant value. Um, and then you can also just use simple, pure, primal emotions. I think this is kind of a weird one, but he's basically saying don't use like hipster emotions, like convoluted, sad, like I, I don't even know. <laughs> just, just don't use complicated emotions. Use simple emotions like anger. Um, and I think that's that's basically the same sort of thing that he's getting at here. Is just get something that they have a lot of experience with and bring it up because then they'll understand it more. Um, so getting back to this, so what's a game? Like, not, not game. that. That's not a game? That's 100 hours. I'd say that it's a game. Simulate, like 130 hours into that. Well, are games not simulations? Some are. I think the word simulator has been kind of misused. Um, because when I think of train simulator, Really, what I would expect is to play as a train. Like, I want to be the train if I'm playing Train Simulator. Um, the point in that is, I think every game is basically a simulation. Like, that's sort of the reason you play it. If you want to get this experience, this foreign experience as something else, it's a simulation where you are that thing. So, I, like, there are plenty of other examples, but I keep bringing this one up. Brutal Legend, a game is, like, awesome, but... It's a simulation where you're a roadie who gets sent back in time, kind of, 
to a different universe and uses the power of metal to save the world. <laughs> um, and it's a simulation. You can live that out through the character in the game. And that's what I want to get across, is that every game is kind of like a simulation. And so you can actually apply a lot of the stuff to simulations that you can apply to other games, which is the player model. The entire value of a game or a simulation is in the thing that the player gets out of it. It's basically saying the game model is what you put into the game, and the player model is what they experience. So if you put this crazy complicated system into the game, and they just walk left instead of right and completely ignore it, then what was the point of that? They didn't get that out of it, so it didn't get injected into the player model. So the way these can differ, and it stinks, uh, there are two examples, Ultima Online and Bioshock. So when they were designing Ultima Online, there's actually this really, really cool ecosystem they were putting in there, which is like, if you kill too many of this animal, well, then the thing that feeds off of that animal will run out of food supplies, and then that other animal will like, go searching for food somewhere else, and chain reaction, and then like, a dragon gets really mad and runs into a city and burns the village down. And so you can have all these crazy like, reactions like that happening in this game. They were like, yes, this game is going to be the best game like, anyone's ever played. And they released it, and all the players ran in guns blazing and killed everything before any of that could happen. <laughs> so the point is, they put this great stuff into the game model, but it's not something that could realistically come out into the player model. So it was kind of pointless. Uh, the same thing, same thing with Bioshock, except they saved themselves this time, is before, they used to have this great relationship between splicers and big daddies and little sisters, where they would like hunt each other and do this kind of crazy like triangle thing. Um, but people would just play it and wouldn't be able to tell. You can't see it because you can only see so much at any given point, especially in an FPS. So they just took it out because there was no point in leaving it in there. It was just added complexity. So how do we win? How do we get stuff into the player's head? Like, yeah, basically, how do we not get it lost on the something room floor? I don't know how to parallel that. Um, so that same guy who gave us that list, I was like, well, you should probably just use the simplest representation for the kind of stuff you want them to get out of it. So again, if Ultima Online is a game about having a community and killing stuff, well, then maybe you don't want to put this entire ecosystem of random animals doing their own thing in there. Like, maybe that's not really what's important to the game experience. Uh, and he has a lot to say about simulations. But the thing that you can sort of take out of that is he's like, well, accuracy can actually be really bad. No one wants to play, like, a perfect simulation, which is not true as far as I'm concerned. But I think the point that you can get out of that is that a perfect simulation isn't really feasible at this point in time, so you might as well just stop and not try. Um, but yeah, accuracy can be bad in that sense, because he thinks if it's too accurate, it stops being fun. Which, eh. Yeah. I think a prime example could be GTA 4. You know, like how GTA 3 was kind of just fun and just, you know, messing around mm -hmm. and stuff. And when it comes to GTA 4, they're trying to be too realistic. And while aka like probably accuracy in a gaming sense, then people would probably just don't really want to play the game anymore because it was just way too realistic. It's not fun anymore. Yeah. It's, it's sort of like, um, I think this is something that Elder Scrolls went through. Uh, which, it makes me sad, but it also, like, it does make sense to some extent. So, like, anyone play Arena, Daggerfall, or Morrowind? Yes. Yeah, okay. So, there's just, like, so much you can choose in that. They went, they went kind of, like, crazy with choices. Uh, I mean, aside from character creation, which is something I'll talk about in a second, but aside from that, there's, like, a lot of stuff that you can do. Um, and noticing the difference between Morrowind and Oblivion is even, like, huge. You can see that Morrowind has like all these subclasses of stuff that you can do in Oblivion, which is just one one thing for all of it. And it's like, it feels sort of like you're being cheated. Like, well, I want to do like this specific thing and be really good at this thing, but not that other thing. But I mean, they did the same thing from Oblivion to Skyrim, right? Like, if you've done that, you'll notice like the skills get even smaller. They just try to generalize everything. But maybe it's because the game isn't even about all of those small things between weapons. It's about killing things. Uh, it's about going on those adventures and exploring the cave. Not as much about 
having a very, very specific class of thing to kill things. Maybe. I guess that's the conclusion they came to. Uh, so the second thing is use hair complexity for cheap fictional flavor. Hair complexity, the example is hair and fallout or just character creation in general. It's not something that seriously impacts the game, except in the Elder Scrolls, which is cool, but it does matter. Um, but in Fallout, like, if you give your character a mohawk and you run around in the world, is anyone seriously going to come up to you and say, hey, you with the mohawk, I'm going to kill you because you have a mohawk? <laughs> no, you're not going to encounter that because Fallout's not a game about hair. <laughs> no one cares. Like, it's hair complexity because in this whole tangled mess of complexity, it's just kind of sticking off. Like, it's not in there. It's just something you can tack onto the game and not make it really more complex. Um, and I don't know. I think that's really strong, just like adding character creation to make the game uh, more fulfilling. Uh, a thing where it went wrong. I didn't have this in the last presentation, so I added it because I thought it could use an example of where this sort of thing went wrong. Actually, I'll talk about this first. Um, so what can we learn out of this? Well, think about what your game is and have it speak the right language. If your game is not about hair, don't add in like crazy <laughs> hair physics and like a billion different choices of color and everything and add like new palettes, uh, create like an entire rendering engine based on hair. Like that's not going to help. I mean, you can do it, but you should really focus on what your game is about as opposed to, I don't know, just things that you can throw in there. Um, complexity isn't inherently bad, but make sure it's necessary, yeah, basically. Um, and with apophenia, if you focus on what's important, like, I don't know, actually playing the game, like the core experience you want to get out of it, you can use apophenia to let the players get all the rest of the stuff that they could be getting out of it, as opposed to putting all of that in your, there yourself and spending time doing something you shouldn't be doing. So the counterexample of this is Spore. Um, I was super excited for this game. Who wasn't? Huh? Who wasn't? It, it sounded amazing, right? But then you actually play it, and each stage itself. So the the great thing about the game was like they were like, yeah, you'll be able to evolve from like the smallest cell to like a crazy interplanetary seafaring like race or whatever. And you're like, yes, I want to play that. But when they finally actually realize it, you realize, oh well. You can play as the little cell, and that that's kind of fun, I guess. And then you can play as the little dude, and yeah, it's okay. And then you play as like the tribal stage, and yeah, I mean, it's like it's, it's like a really watered down version of Civ. And then you play the higher stage than that, and it's like a less watered down, but still very watered down <laughs> version of Civ. And then you get to the space stage, and it's like a really simple space collect spice thing. And you realize like. Well, because they had to do all of these things, that's what the game was about. Like, they spread themselves so thin that if they just focused on, like, one of these stages, it really would have been a much better game. Spore made me sad. <laughs> Spore game. What was oh, well. EA? So what do you expect? There was one really cool thing about this game, which was that it would download uh, creatures from other people's games to, like, randomly populate your universe which got bad when people started realizing yeah. that they could make things they shouldn't be making. <laughs> like animals that look like certain things. And so like you come down on a planet and see like these horrible like genital monsters running around and you're like, okay, I'm leaving this place. <laughs> but yeah, point is, understand the scope of your game and stick to it. Uh, and I think that's something everybody can benefit from even if like, you're not particularly interested in designing the game. Because, I don't know, working on each individual piece, you can consider this. But yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Yay. Yay. <laughs>